Real Virginia is produced by the Virginia Farm Bureau. Farming, it's all good. Visit our website at vafarmbureau.org. Chesapeake Bay, Atlantic to Appalachia, home in my heart always. Hello everyone and welcome to Real Virginia, a show about Virginia agriculture and the people who produce all the wonderful products we enjoy. Virginia needs more grape growers. We'll learn why industry leaders want to see a lot more grape vines planted soon. We show you how you can get a jump on spring in your home, and we explain what is making Virginia's green industry grow to record numbers. Welcome back everyone. We are here at Greenland Nursery in Orange County where they produce plants, trees and shrubs for both businesses and residential customers. And we're going to talk a little bit later on in our show about the fifth largest agriculture sector in Virginia. But first we're going to take a trip to wine country and tell you why winemakers in Virginia are encouraging landowners to start producing more grapes in the Old Dominion. The modern Virginia wine industry is almost 30 years old now and it's getting rave reviews from all around the world. But in order to take advantage of those reviews and continue to grow the industry, Virginia grape growers say we need to scale up production. The 2014 Virginia Wine Guide lists 254 wineries. Almost all of them also grow grapes. Another 350 or so vineyards grow grapes as well for the industry. But state law requires at least 50% Virginia grown grapes in Virginia wines. And with the recent explosive growth of the industry, that's an opportunity and a problem. Right now is a great time to start a vineyard. Uh, obviously, we need the grapes. That means there's, there is a demand. There's not a oversupply like in some industries. Uh, so therefore, you've already got a market preset ready to go for you. Len Thompson knows his grapes. He was named Virginia's 2013 Grape Grower of the Year. The Navy veteran was looking for a second career a few years ago and found it on property he and his wife own in Amherst County. If you have even a few acres of land, you can start a vineyard too. But Thompson says do your homework first. If you've got land, the best thing I would, I would uh, tell anybody to do is to get a hold of a good consultant. And uh, there are many of them, uh, quite a few of them, uh, and that would be the very first thing to do. The second thing to do is there is a book that made, or a book made by Dr. Tony Wolf at Virginia Tech, and it is growing uh, great production on the eastern seaboard. Um, that particular book will tell you not only a good business plan, for what a vineyard entails or a winery entails, not so much a winery, more vineyard, but also will tell you what you need to do, how to do it, what kind of things you're going to, uh, problems you're going to have. Having said all that, Thompson is bullish on grape production. Sales of Virginia wine are growing by 5% each year. He says most Virginia vineyards are three to five acres, the minimum needed to get into the supply chain. But don't be afraid to think bigger. You're not going to sell 200 pounds of grapes to a winery. They want tons. So uh, that's going to dictate the amount of vineyard you're going to need. The state of Virginia continues to promote the wine industry, and there are plenty of resources for beginning grape growers. Thompson says some farm lenders are now loaning money for vineyards, and tax credits may be available. It all requires doing your homework and being patient. It may take as long as five years for a vineyard to come into full production. It's great fun. Is it a challenge? It's a great challenge. Is it a hugely profitable? It could be. Uh, most of the profit in the wine industry comes in the, at the winery stage, but if you want to grow things, if you want to get into the dirt with your hands, this is the business. It is, is it easy? No. Is it farming? Yes. If you're interested in growing grapes commercially, contact your local cooperative extension office to get connected to the Virginia Tech Wine Research Program or contact the Virginia Vineyards Association to learn more. In Amherst County, Virginia, I'm Norm Hyde. There are more than 400 farms in Amherst County raising a wide variety of crops, livestock, nursery products, and even wine grapes. This is big cattle country with a lot of beef cattle and even a few dairy and poultry farms. Hay is a commodity raised here along with some fruit orchards and corn and grain production. Wine grapes are already an important commodity, generating more than $51,000 in cash receipts a year, right behind apples. Altogether, agriculture generates more than $7.6 million in cash receipts for the farmers of Amherst County, Virginia. 
I'm Mark Viette. Coming up on In the Garden, we're going to talk about bringing the outdoors indoors. Stay with us. We are at the top of the Shenandoah Valley in Winchester, Virginia. My grandparents started the farm in 1906. My dad started the dairy in 1948. I came back to the farm in 1977 to help my dad and my mom to run the farm and it was the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. Shannon is my youngest daughter. Jackie is my uh, oldest daughter. They have such wonderful work ethics. Shannon is my right-hand person here. She helps with the milking. If I need something, at the drop of a hat, she's here. It's so wonderful to have daughters that have that sense of responsibility, sense of country, sense of love for the farm, and I know they will always be here to carry it on. I'm Kitty Huckman Nicholas, and I'm dedicated to dairy, my cows, my milk, and my land. You can start enjoying your plants earlier this year by forcing them indoors. Our Mark Viet shows us the trick in the garden. Having gardens outside is great. You can enjoy plants as they naturally bloom throughout the season, but you can also bring that outdoors inside. And what you have to do is just go out in your garden and before plants actually come into flower, for example, something like quince, you can cut them when they're in bud. And then you can even wrap them in wet burlap or put them in a bucket of cool water, keep them in a garage. And when you're ready to bring them indoors, put them in a vase with warm water. And then heat in the home will give you something just like this. There are other plants that you could force. Dogwoods, cherries, red buds, forsythia, lots of flowers and branches of plants that you can enjoy at least a month before they normally bloom in the garden. And let me show you some of these other plants now. Crab apples are easy to force indoors. And many of them are right in our own backyard already. And if not, you can plant crab apples. When you're cutting from your garden, I always like to cut long, beautiful displays of the plant, not short stubby branches. So branches that are anywhere from one to three years old. This is the beautiful pearl bush, which is known as the bride. And you have to have this. This is Coriolopsis, and it has these beautiful hanging flowers. So you're gonna cut this in bud, and when you bring it indoors, the warm water and the warmth will force it into flowering like this. A lot of us have red buds in our garden, or we have access to red buds. And this is one of my favorite red buds known as the pure white or white red bud or Circus alba. And what you wanna do is cut them when the buds are nice and fat, just like this. And if you wanna hold them for a week or two, you can even put them in a refrigerator and wrap them in moist paper towels or blankets or burlap to keep them for another week or two. These are all easy to use from your garden and they'll give you wonderful displays that you can mix together or have as a single item in each vase. The longest part was going out and cutting all the plants in bud. Now remember, you have to time this. You really don't want to wait till they're in full flower. You want to cut them when they're in bud so they bloom earlier than normal. Now this is a cherry that after force will look like this. And when you cut it, you might even cut them when they have buds that are smaller than this. Other plants that you can consider using are going to be the magnolia and the beautiful purple or there's even yellow and even white magnolias. They're gonna be cut when they're in bud, and then when you force them indoors, they're gonna come into flower like this. And one of my favorite magnolias to use is known as the star magnolia. This is one that many times gets frozen in the garden in the spring. So if you cut it early enough, you can bypass that late frost that you might have. Coralopsis, is great. Again, when you cut it, it's going to sort of look like this with small buds. And then when it comes into flower, it's going to be like this. To give you a great example of what forsythia is going to look like when you cut it in the garden, forsythia, when you're cutting it, it's going to look like this with buds ready to pop. 
and when you force it indoors, they look like this. So it gives you a whole month earlier and bring that outdoors indoors. When you're all done, I'll show you what it's going to look like in the home. This is the fun part. Instead of this being your cherry or this being your Forsythia, you can have this great arrangement indoors a month before spring hits outside in your garden. I'm Mark Viette. Join me next time in the garden. For more garden tips, go to inthegardenradio.com. Looking for an easy recipe that keeps you out of the kitchen most of the day? We have got a great slow cooker dish next in the heart of the home. Today, 720 new cases of breast cancer will be, will be diagnosed. diagnosed. Every, Every day, 120 women will die from, from the, the disease. disease. You, you can, can make a difference for the more than 6,300 women diagnosed in Virginia, Virginia this year. year. Education, Education, early detection are critical in this fight by advocating for the needs of those of us suffering from the disease. Let's keep breast cancer awareness out in front so we can leave the disease behind. When the winds of winter are whipping around, there is nothing better than enjoying a hot bowl of bean soup for dinner. Our Kendra Bailey Morris shows us a great slow cooker recipe in the heart of the home. Hi, I'm Kendra Bailey Morris and welcome to the heart of the home. Today we're going to be making a slow cooker recipe and then those of you in the know know that I really love slow cooking and I have a book out called The Southern Slow Cooker if you would like to purchase it. This recipe is actually not in the book but there's a very similar one and this is a classic slow cooker recipe where you get out your dried beans and you make something really hearty and comforting and delicious and I absolutely love this recipe and it's really, really simple. Very minimal prep work up front. So to start, I've got some white beans in here. Now you could use navy beans or cannellini beans if you'd like, and they have been soaked overnight, and that's a step that I like to do. It speeds up the cooking process. As, and um, for certain beans, you need to do that for safety reasons, like red beans, you should definitely soak overnight because they have certain enzymes in them that you want to soak out. Um, meanwhile, I'm going to start adding some aromatics, and I'm basically gonna add what's called a mirepoix, which is a combination of onion and celery and carrot. And I'm just going to dice some onion up here. And this is uh, about a cup of onion or so. And I'm going to dice the other side, or actually more of a chop. You don't want to chop it up too finely because this is going to cook a really long time. Beans, uh, especially for those of you who have slow cooked beans before, can take anywhere, anywhere of 10 to 11, 12 hours depending. Uh, so if you have vegetables in there, they're going to cook and cook and cook and cook. And if they're at a really small dice, um, they can almost cook to the point of disappearing and you don't necessarily want that. All right. So I'm just doing a rough chop on these. I'm going to add these in. And what I've got here, and I've already chopped these up for the sake of brevity, is I have um, about a half cup or so of um, chopped celery. And I really like the flavor of celery here. And again, it's part of that mirepoix. And then I've got some carrots that are chopped up as well. And it makes a really nice flavor, but most importantly, it gives it a nice color. Otherwise, you just kind of have these beans that are kind of sitting out there colorless and lonely. Um, at any rate, I've got some um, diced ham, some diced Virginia ham. This is just some sweet ham, like some honey ham. This is a really wonderful recipe if you've um, done some holiday entertaining or some um, Easter entertaining and you have um, a leftover ham bone. In this case, we're going to be using a ham hock. And I really like the ham hock. The meatier the ham hock, the better. And of course, this is Virginia pork, which we are known for. And I'm just going to nestle that in there. Now I've got some diced garlic, finely minced or diced. And what I'm going to add next is a little bit of uh, some uh, bay leaves. These are just dried bay leaves. I've got Oh, I'd say probably two bay leaves up to you. I really like to put bay leaves in um, slow cooker recipes because they hold up well. And I'm also going to add some fresh sage, about a tablespoon. And I'm just going to go ahead and just 
chop this up very loosely. When you're chopping herbs, um, the easiest way to chop fresh herbs is to make them in a little ball like I just did. And then they chop up real nicely and quickly instead of trying to chop them up, um, laying flat on a surface that takes forever and they don't chop up as evenly that way. You could use dry sage for this as well. All right. Finally, because I like cayenne pepper, I'm just going to do a little bit of cayenne in there, possibly adding more later. And then I've got some nice um, paprika, and this is a sweet Hungarian paprika. I'm going to do about a quarter teaspoon or so, and this um, creates a really pretty color, but it's also a really nice flavor as well. One thing you want to remember when slow cooking is that whatever herbs and spices you put in there up front, after 10 hours, are going to be highly diluted. So as you see, I didn't add any salt or pepper to this. I'm just going to kind of let it go and do its thing. Um, salt and pepper tends to just cook out, and the flavor cooks out, um, and you'll have to add more later on anyway. So just go ahead and cook and see what you have. Now what I'm going to do now is add some water, and it really is just enough to cover by about a half inch or so. That's about right. And don't worry if your ham hock is exposed here. It will continue to cook. I'm just going to mix this around. Excellent. And this is done. So what I'm going to do now is go ahead and cover this. And I'm going to cook it anywhere from, depending on uh, how hot your slow cooker runs, it could be 8 to 10 hours, it could be 10 to 12 hours. So I would set it for 8 and then come back and then test your beans for doneness. Don't open it if you can avoid it. It will extend 20 minutes. Uh, every time you open it, it adds another 20 minutes cooking time. So you want to try to avoid that. So I'm going to go ahead and plug this in and let it go. And then I'll show you what to do when we're finished. We'll be right back. Okay, so it's been about nine hours or so, and the beans are done, and they look really, really, really nice. They're nice and creamy, and what I've done is I took the back of a fork uh, and just mashed some up against the side. You don't have to do that. I just like a creamier texture um, for my beans, and that's just a personal preference. And so now I'm just going to add a little bit of salt, a couple spins of the pepper, and this is the, at the point where you would want to taste and see if you need to add more seasonings. Uh, do keep in mind that as uh, anything cooks in the slow cooker, it waters down and flavors water down, so you probably will have to add back at some point. Now what I've also done is I've removed that ham hock, and you can see it's literally just falling off the bone. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and discard the bones, and I'm going to salvage whatever meat I can off of it. You don't want to throw anything out, not where I come from. And then you've got the skin and the fat and all that, and that can just go ahead and go in the trash. And you have a few little pieces that you can salvage. And what I'm going to do is just chop these up and add them back. You can cook it a few minutes longer, but this is already cooked. You don't need to necessarily do that. Um, depending on your ham hock or whatever type of seasoning meat you're using, you might have a lot of meat. So be prepared. Um, some ham hocks are meatier than others. So I'm just going to chop this up. And see, that's a nice little bit of ham right there. Excellent. And I'm just going to swirl that in. There you go. And now I'm going to go ahead and just plate this. This is such a great meal, wonderful cornbread or spoon bread or something really good like that. And I'm just going to garnish this with a little bit of fresh mint sage for color. You can add a little parsley on top, a couple spins of uh, the black pepper or maybe some cayenne pepper if you like that and hot sauce really good also parmesan cheese is really good on this I've tried it that way before so here you have it um, this is a slow cooker white bean and ham stew or soup however you want to call it and it's done in your slow cooker easy peasy feeds a lot of people very hearty it's all about winter um, my name is Kendra Bailey Morris let's get cooking Recipes from the heart of the home can be found on the Virginia Farm Bureau website at vafarmbureau.org Have you heard that carrots are good for your eyes? It's true. Carrots are a great source of beta carotene and contain a high amount of fiber. Beta carotene is important for eyesight, skin health, and normal growth. Just one medium carrot or a handful of baby carrots is equal to one serving of daily vegetables. The United States is the third largest producer of carrots behind China and the Russian Federation. Carrots are grown in most east and west coast states, including Virginia. Be sure to look for local carrots at your farmer's markets across the state. 
Americans eat an average of 10.6 pounds of fresh carrots per person per year. Been a while since you've taken a boating safety course? Visit www.huntfishva.com to learn about Virginia's new boating safety education requirement. Don't get left in the past. The Virginia green industry continues to grow as more people get interested in gardening and landscaping. With $3 billion of economic impact, this is a business that is vital for the future of Virginia. Growing and selling trees, shrubs, annuals, perennials, herbs, and grasses is big business in Virginia. In fact, there are more than 290 growers and 11,000 acres of nursery production in the state. Dan Gregg is president of Grelin Nursery in Orange County. The 600-acre nursery is open to the public, and Greg believes that it is a secret to the company's 22 years in business. What I have found to be very successful with our business is that we are marketing to the consumer, to the end user. So it's what in business school they would call vertical integration. Um, we've kind of eliminated the middleman, and so the trees that we're growing out in the fields, um, most of these I get to see where they're going in somebody's yard. The greenhouse and nursery industry is one of the fastest growing segments of Virginia's farm economy. Sales of horticultural products in Virginia increased 73 percent in the past decade. Horticulture ranks fifth on Virginia's list of agricultural commodities. Not bad for an industry that was hardly on the map in terms of farm gate value just a few decades ago. In Virginia specifically, we're close to Washington DC, we have Richmond, we have the whole regional area that prior to Virginia nurseries propping up in the area, um, prior to that people had to buy the trees from North Carolina or Tennessee, but freight costs have increased with fuel costs and so now nurseries are, are propping up closer to the actual end market. Greg also credits his consumers with becoming landscape savvy prior to visiting the nursery. People are becoming more educated and they're becoming more educated either through the local extension service, through the master gardener programs, but also through the internet, through Google. We have people that come here before I considered to know that I would know more than my average client, but now there are people that come here and they say, I want this specific variety or cultivar of a plant. Studies have shown the Virginia green industry employs more than 60% of agriculture workers in the state, and Greg believes this trend continues to grow as more students graduate and move into the field of horticulture. I am really excited for the industry as a whole in the state of Virginia. Both Virginia State University, which focuses more on vegetable production, um, more the farm the table side of things, and then Virginia Tech with the, the larger farm the, um, and nursery production. Young um, students coming out of college, there are opportunities where they can make a living in horticulture and in agriculture. And that's exciting because that wasn't necessarily the case. 10, 20, 30 years ago. With the increased public interest in landscaping and gardening, this banker turned nurseryman predicts the industry will continue to grow as fast as his plants do. I love coming to work every day and there are not a whole lot of people that can say that. I tell my children, I don't care what you do in life, you've got to wake up in the morning and love what you do. That's going to do it for this edition of Real Virginia. We are so glad you could join us to celebrate the bounty Virginia has to offer. Whether it's in your home, your garden, or your landscape, we are proud to say that this is Rural Virginia. So for everyone from the Virginia Farm Bureau, thanks for watching, make it a good month. Sure.